Well, good morning to our Hawaii friends and good afternoon to our other um, friends across our region, Alaska, Montana, Wyoming. We're so glad to have you join us today, our fifth of our It's Worth a Shot series. Uh, today, we will hear from Kyla Newland. She will speak about uh, COVID therapeutics. You know, every, as with the pandemic, everything is changing quickly and so she'll give us the latest um, of updates. And then we will hear from Jesse Kinney, who it will bring to us a presentation on vaccine accessibility. So we're looking forward to that session today. Does anybody have any questions uh, before we get started? You're welcome to, this is interactive. You're welcome to chime in or you're also welcome to use the chat function in our uh, Teams are in our Zoom box here today. Also, we, um, you can advance the slide, Mary. We just like to take this time at the front of each of our uh, sessions to remind you that if you have any topics or um, ideas that you would like to hear from a clinician on, we've had our, so far, our, our clinician has been Kyla and she's a pharmacist. We have other access to um, other clinicians as well. So it doesn't have to be limited to pharmacy questions. So if you think of something uh, throughout this session or throughout your work week that you'd like to see us cover, we're flexible and happy to accommodate. So we will continue meeting each Wednesday. Uh, right now, we know it'll be through the 13th of April, that more to come after that possibly. And then uh, the next slide, please. I think we'll get started. We did not have any residual um, FAQs from last week. We did send out the most recent FAQ um, resource tool. So we'll keep adding to that as questions do come up. So with that, I will turn it over to Kyla. Thanks, Kyla. Thank you, Jill. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So today I'm going to be talking about the um, outpatient therapeutics that are available for COVID-19. And just to kind of preface this, um, I wanted to just show a short video about the emergency use authorization. This is the way that all of these products have been approved um, thus far, and also the process um, in which the COVID-19 vaccines were approved initially. Now we have full FDA approval for our um, mRNA vaccines, but initially they were authorized through this EUA process. So Mary, if you wanna go ahead, this just gives us kind of a good overview. Americans rely on the FDA to evaluate whether medical products, such as drugs, diagnostic tests, and other medical devices have been shown to be safe and effective. When a public health emergency hits, like the infectious disease outbreak we're facing with COVID-19, there may be an urgent need for products to diagnose, treat, or prevent a medical threat. In certain types of emergencies, the FDA can issue an Emergency Use Authorization, or EUA, to provide more timely access to drugs, diagnostic tests, or other critical medical products that may help during the emergency when there are no adequate approved and available options. The EUA process is different than full approval of these products because in some emergency situations, we just cannot wait for all the evidence needed for full FDA approval. Instead, the FDA evaluates the options very quickly using the evidence that is available and carefully balances any known or potential risks of these unproven products with any known or potential benefits to the public of making them available during the emergency. For example, while we need to move quickly, it is not in the best interest of Americans for the FDA to allow use of a test that doesn't work as it should. False test results can contribute to the spread of an infectious disease like COVID-19. EUAs are just one of several tools the FDA can use to help make important medical products available quickly during emergencies. For more information on FDA's efforts against COVID-19, please visit FDA.gov. All right, we can go on to the next slide, Mary. Okay, so um, this is just a nice little chart um, that I kind of reproduced. It's um, from the Department of Health here in Alaska. It gives you just kind of a nice overview of the outpatient COVID-19 therapies. 
um, and the age restrictions, um, the time frame in which you need to initiate therapy for them to be most effective, their mechanism of action. Um, so the monoclonal antibodies, um, citrovimab is the only one um, that has been shown effective against Omicron. And additionally, this week, we had another one actually approved that's not on this chart because it's so um, brand new called Betelbetelovimab. So I'm still learning how to say um, these new therapies, but as we were talking about earlier, sometimes it's nice just to refer to them as the MABs um, because that's a little bit easier. So um, in addition to, um, in, for the monoclonal antibodies, to add to this chart, um, it is approved for, um, betelevimab is approved for 12 and older, and you must initiate therapy within seven days, and it is also IV therapy. And then you can see um, the route of administration for our two orals. We've got Paxlovid and Molnipiravir. Those are the two oral therapies that we have currently. And then um, also the duration of treatment for these. I shared with Mary, um, also this side-by-side -side overview of therapies that's in the chat. And, and it's a little more extensive of a document from, uh, I believe it's from the um, Department of Health and Social Services. So if you guys, if, if you need more details on kind of all the specifics for each of these therapies, and I am gonna go through each one on a slide and just kind of give a little general overview, but take a look at that. It hasn't been updated since December. So it is missing um, that new monoclonal that has just been approved and um, might have a little bit of outdated information on some. So the best place to get the most up-to-date information is gonna be the EUAs specific for each therapy, which I have included in my resources slide. Next slide, please. So um, Paxlovid, this is our first uh, oral therapy. This has been shown to be effective against the Omicron um, variant in, um, in lab studies. So um, that's why they approved it for EUA. We're still waiting to see um, kind of like real world results, but it was shown to um, reduce hospitalization and death by 88%. It's um, dosing regimen listed here. It does have adjustments for patients who have compromised renal function and also um, severe hepatic function. So those are good clinical considerations. And then also it is um, an inducer of the CYP3A system, which is an enzyme system that drugs are metabolized through. And so any drugs that are metabolized through that system are gonna be considered um, pretty significant drug interactions, either increasing concentrations or decreasing concentrations based on um, if they're an inducer or an inhibitor of the system. So if you take a look at the uh, EUA for Paxlovid, there's a very extensive chart that lists all these drug interactions if, if you need to check um, that for your patients. And then um, one that I wanted to point out is the fact that um, it does reduce the um, effectiveness of oral contraceptives. So they do recommend um, giving women that warning and having them use backup contraception. So that's just one of the more clinically significant ones that I noted. I think we can go to the next slide. So this is our second oral therapy, molnipiravir. Um, this was shown to be a little bit less effective um, against Omicron versus Paxlovid, but it is um, commercially more readily available right now. So it um, was shown to be about 30% effective in hospitalizations um, and deaths. It was 50% initially, but went down to 30% when they started looking at the Omicron variant. So it is actually a um, kind of a high pill load, as you would say, um, patients have to take four capsules twice a day. Um, advantages over Paxlovid would be that it does not have dosing adjustment for any renal or hepatic function impairment, and no, um, it's not recommended in pregnancy at all. Paxlovid doesn't specifically say we can give it in pregnancy, but it doesn't say that we can't, so it's kind of um, up in the air on that one still for pregnancy and breastfeeding, but this one is a definite no. Side effects, um, pretty mild diarrhea, nausea, and dizziness. Next slide, please. 
So the monoclonal antibodies, as I mentioned, citrovimab has been, um, has had an EUA for uh, quite a while now. And I wanted to point out that all of these um, medications that are approved for oral therapy are under EUA, which um, restricts the use to high-risk patients. So you'll see that um, this is with patients who've um, been diagnosed and then also are at high risk. And I've included that list. It's a pretty extensive list. Um, some of the, the most common um, indications for high risk that you'll see are patients that are obese, patients that have diabetes, uh, chronic kidney failure, chronic lung disease. Hypertension is actually included, which is going to affect um, a, a pretty high proportion of patients. And then there's kind of an extensive expanded list um, for the patients that are actually um, approved under EUA um, for all of these therapies. And there's a video. If you guys um, want to learn more about how monoclonal antibodies work, it's basically just um, instead of your body making antibodies, it's your artificially in injecting or um, putting those into your body to help um, make your immune system more robust. Next slide, please. So this is the, um, the new monoclonal antibody that was just approved. And this one, if, if you notice the difference in um, the approval of it, there's the addition of, um, it should only be used if other approved or authorized products are not available. So it's kind of down the list a little ways on our, on our treatment options at this point. But it is, um, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't look at the percentage effective against Omicron like the other ones. I'm not sure that we know that yet but it has been shown to be effective against Omicron. Next slide, please. So this is um, remdesivir. This is a product that was initially approved for inpatient treatment of COVID, and now it has recently been expanded to be approved for uh, outpatient treatment as well. So adding that to our outpatient treatment. Um, and... This one is also an injectable, so it would be something that you would need to go to an infusion center to be able to receive this therapy. Next slide, please. This is a really nice chart that um, the Alaska Department of Health put together that helps you um, decide which therapeutic is, is the best choice for your patient. I've got, we've got the link here and um, there's actually a second page that has um, more specifics for the pediatric population. But as you'll notice, um, the new monoclonal isn't included on this yet, but will be added um, probably soon. So take a look at that. And it's a, ni it's a nice visual and an easy way to figure out what would be the best therapy for your patients. Next slide, please. So this is um, the only product, EvuShield, that is approved for prophylaxis of COVID-19 at this point. And really, this is going to be um, a limited um, group of patients, but it's going to be either those folks that are moderately to severely Im immunocompromised, and this is just for prevention, not when someone has been exposed. It's just flat out, my patient is high risk for COVID, and I want to protect them because their immune system is, is not up to par. So it is administered as two separate um, injectable intramuscular injections, and it should be dosed every six months. This also is for patients that have had either an anaphylactic reaction or a severe adverse reaction to the vaccine and are not able to get additional doses to complete their dosing series. Next slide, please. So here's um, just all the resources that I mentioned. If you want all the details for each of these, these EUAs are basically the package inserts um, for each drug that has all the same information that you'll see um, for drugs that are fully approved. Also, the therapeutics finder is, is useful. It'll show you where therapies are available in your area and which pharmacies are carrying them. In the state of Alaska, the state is, and I think this is happening in every state, the state is getting allocations of the drugs and then they're distributing them amongst the state. 
And in our state, they've chosen only um, two pharmacies that they're actually um, going to be distributing to. And so um, that's something to consider. And that's where this therapeutics finder can come in really handy if you're wanting to figure out which pharmacies have these therapies. And then I also listed here um, for reference, the moderately to severely immunocompromised and high risk conditions for the patients that would be prioritized to get these therapies at this time. In Alaska, um, they are also doing um, priority categories of patients. Um, since there is limited supply of these drugs at this time. And so um, your states might be doing something similar where they have a tier of um, how you prioritize patients to get these therapies. And I would love to have questions or comments, things that are going on in other states as far as supply chains and anything else that you have questions about. Mm, that's a good question. There's a question in the chat um, about who is considered recently exposed to COVID-19 for um, using EvuShield. And I don't know the answer to that, but I can certainly find out what, um, what that time frame would be. I would think it would probably be that 10 day time frame that we have um, for quarantine, um, but I don't know that for sure. So we can put that in our questions for next week. Also, along those lines, I guess I was also wondering if they've had COVID, is there a certain time frame before they would be eligible to have that treatment? So um, that's a good question on the orals, um, or I'm sorry, for EvuShield. I do not know that either. I know that for the monoclonal antibodies, they used to say that you had to wait um, 90 days after you'd had COVID to receive those, but they just changed that and said that you don't have to um, uh, wait that 90-day yeah. period. I'll, I'll tell you where I'm going. I've, we've got a resident who had some um, significant facial swelling with her first dose um, of a vaccine, and mm -hmm. so the providers chose not to give her a second dose. Um, so we're just wondering how we can protect her. Um, she actually did end up um, getting COVID, so I'm wondering, is this an option for her, and, and when would we look at that? But I can pass some information to our providers so they can look into it too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we can put that on our, um, our Q and A and make sure that we get the answer to that for you for next week. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? Are folks seeing these medicines used um, in your in your facilities? I'll add we we saw some use um, maybe early on with COVID, but with this last bout with Omicron, folks haven't been that symptomatic, so there hasn't been as much of a need. And of course, having vaccines in place really helps too. Yeah, absolutely. Kathy says she's had several um, residents receive monoclonal antibodies. And just to note um, about the monoclonal antibodies too, the, originally we had the three options. And then um, we found out that two out of the three were ineffective for Omicron. And so Citrovimab is the only one that was kind of left. And now we have the, the newer one that just got approved. Well, thank you everyone. And um, if there are things that you want to see in the future as far as um, therapeutics, um, let us know and we can definitely build that into our content. So I'll turn it over to Jesse. Thanks, Kyla. Appreciate it. Um, excuse me. So for my part of the series, I thought we'd touch about on upon vaccine accessibility. Uh, we've had a few questions come up about the state vaccine provider programs. So we thought we'd take this opportunity to 
kind of do a thousand foot view of what that program looks like and then revisit what vaccine resources we have in the community. But before I do that, we do have a special guest. I believe she should be on the line. Um, her name is Trisha Gardner. Trisha is the Adult Immunization Coordinator with Montana's Public Health and Safety Division, the Immunization Program. And she's graciously offered to join us today. Um, certainly glad to have her and if she can help with, with any Q&A. So Trisha, if you'd like to introduce yourself and say hello. Thank you, Jesse. Can you guys hear me okay? Oh, yep, yep. All right. Yeah, so as Jesse said, I'm the Adult Immunization Coordinator for Montana. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions if you have them about, you know, getting enrolled as COVID provider or resources that we may have here. Um, so just happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Trisha, for joining us. So if you guys think of any questions, you know, feel free to put them in the chat or, or we can save them for, for Q&A towards the end and, and we can definitely utilize our resources, resource that's uh, graciously joined us. So, so again, we've, we've been getting some questions about the state vaccine provider program. So I thought I'd just kind of share some information forward and go over the enrollment process. So to, to back up a little bit further, um, the state vaccine provider program, what this means and, and what this is, is essentially a program that would allow uh, enrolled centers then to be able to order, administer, manage your own vaccine supply, specifically COVID-19 vaccine supply. So, um, <clears throat> you would be able to kind of manage that process internally. To date, between Alaska, Wyoming, and Montana, there's a, a little fewer than a dozen enrolled as far as long-term care centers in this program. Uh, enrollment requirements, um, these are the kind of the, the big ones to be aware of um, as you dive into the application process. Uh, of no surprise, the storage requirements and temperature monitoring requirements, those all need to meet at minimum CDC standards. Now, they don't necessarily need to be a $2,000 uh, vaccine fridge. And I know with the Montana Immunization Group, as you go through your application process, they'll actually reach out and work with you and, and um, you know, get your manufacturer model number of the fridge to make sure it's compliant before you even go go further. So um, they'll kind of help you along there. Now, as far as the thermometer, so um, that does require the, um, the continuous uh, temperature monitoring. So those digital data loggers, those run about $300. So that's, you know, part of your, your um, prerequisite here for enrollment. Uh, medical licenses for the prescribing providers, uh, those all need to be current. Provider agreement needs to be current. Um, necessary information for vaccine distribution center. Um, with that or sent system, essentially, you want, we want to make sure that all that information is up to date. Um, if you're using Imitrex in Montana, for example, or Vaxtrax in Alaska for, for tracking your immunizations, are you currently doing that? Are you up to speed with um, training there? And do you have active users? I know with uh, turnover, that can be a barrier as far as looking at utilizing some of these systems. So staff training, as we look at enrollment requirements, um, you'll, we'll wanna make sure that, that we have dedicated staff um, that can manage the vaccine inventory, especially if you look at potentially having multiple types of COVID-19 vaccine in your, in your facility. And ultimately be aware that you'll wanna have a program management plan in place as you look at uh, survey compliance. Uh, managing COVID-19 vaccine in-house is really not like managing flu vaccine. Um, there's, there's a lot more commitment to it. So you wanna make sure you're updating your policies and procedures and you're aware of those um, very specific requirements uh, for handling this vaccine. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as we look at inventory management, again, um, the states, most of that, that's going to occur through your state immunization information system. So again, Montana's MTRAX, Alaska's VAXTRAX, for example, um, the, the ordering, the waste, inventory management, um, that, that all goes through there. And there's reporting timelines around that. So that's again, where it's very important to have that trained, dedicated staff, multiple individuals that are able to handle that, that workload. Um, inventory management, I'll touch upon, and I have a great slide here, um, I'll show you in a sec. Um, minimum order quantities. When you direct order, uh, you're looking at about 300 doses, a minimum order for Pfizer, 100 for uh, Moderna and 50 for J&J &J at this time. But being a member of the state vaccine provider programs, you do have that ability to transfer smaller quantities from enrolled member to enrolled member. So we'll go next slide, please. So um, this, <laughs> Kyla might recognize this. Um, you guys had this um, from your immunization unit on a call a couple of weeks ago, and I just thought it was a nice uh, description of that direct order breakdown when you're trying to quantify those minimum orders versus what's that going to look like for me for usage on a weekly basis. Um, maybe you're not a very high admission um, facility, so you know these quantities might be um, definitely out of range. But if you look on here for the, the Pfizer adult vaccine, again, that direct minimum order size is 300 doses. Um, and it's nice, you know, the stability in the refrigerator, 10 weeks. Usage breakdown, that breaks down to about a vial a day. When you look at the Moderna, um, again, 100 direct minimum uh, order quantity, refrigerate storage time about 30 days and you break that down to usage and it's about three vials a week. So I kind of liked this because then you could gauge what your usage looks like um, and what that potential order quantity may look like. And one thing to note too, uh, when you do the direct order through this program, you also receive the ancillary kits with the vaccine. So your um, syringes, your needles, it's kind of a package deal. But if you start transferring quantity between other enrolled centers, then um, you'll wanna make sure that you get those ancillary supplies transferred along with it. So uh, go ahead, next slide, please. So again, you know, that's a brief overview of, of um, what that enrollment process may entail. Just a little introduction there. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity though to reiterate all of our resources and our options that are available. And those state immunization departments are a wealth of knowledge and they are really dedicated individuals that are there to best match up your um, uh, vaccine partners in your community that'll meet your needs, your center's needs um, for ongoing vaccinations. And those local health departments have, have continued to be there when we needed them. And our, our local clinics, and especially those hospitals in the more rural areas too. So those folks, they, 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 I encourage you, if, if you don't know those contacts, um, you know, I, I'd encourage you to reach out and find, find the names of those individuals. Um, and then just reiterating that, you know, not everybody's needs are the same. So, um, you know, those folks can connect you with the best resource. So next slide, please. So here's um, the, some direct contacts I was able to obtain, um, uh, some email addresses so you can get a hold of individuals if you have um, <clears throat> some questions or ongoing needs to meet your immunization needs for COVID-19 uh, at your center. And with that, Trisha, if you had any other, uh, uh, anything I missed or any additional comments. I think just to reiterate, um, use the resources that are there. Those, what we've seen in Montana, and I'm sure it's the same in all the other states, it really is important to partner with 
a hospital or federally qualified health center, one of those other places um, that can help when you're looking at the order quantity, they can transfer vaccine into you rather than you having to have all that storage on site. So really consider those options when you're looking at that and talk to your state immunization department. They've, they will help connect you with people that can work alongside of you and help you meet your needs. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. Any other questions? Jill, I'll pass it back to you to close it out. Thank you, Jesse. So this concludes our uh, fifth session of It's Worth a Shot. We thank you for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you.